This is my first show in Atlanta. Atlanta debut right here live at the print shop. Yep. Pretty amazing. You got mm -hmm. a tour coming up, I hear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got my first headlining tour. Just had my first headlining show at the Exit Inn. You were there. I was there. It was really it was good. wild. Yeah, really I've, good. I've, I've been basically opening up for other people for the past two years, pretty much kind of post-COVID and just kind of figuring it since I started this whole process. And now, yeah, like I guess people want to come see me. And uh, that's that's wild. Yeah. So yeah, we we have an almost sold out tour that's been up for sale for like five days, <laughs> and uh, it's pretty wild that it's happening. And uh, so yeah, I can't wait to go out and play these songs for people and and meet people. Let's yeah. talk about the Exit In show in, in Nashville. The Exit In show is on the top of my mind because I was there. I watched your emotion come out and how much gratitude and how thankful you were. And you said a couple things that were almost heartbreaking to me. And one of the things were, I've never been cool my whole entire life. And you guys are making me feel a little less uncool right now. It hit me, man, it hit me. Can you tell me where that came from? Growing up, I was, I was very quiet. I wasn't a popular kid in school and I wasn't cool. I was a little fella. Uh, I grew up a boxer, my dad was a fighter. And so I kind of expressed myself through boxing and then I didn't really talk. So when you don't really talk, it's really hard to be cool. It's hard to be like a cool kid when you don't talk to nobody. And I'd say the question that's been asked me most of my life is, do you ever talk? <laughs> I just kind of floated around a couple friends that I, I loved, you know, and kind of hung out with. And that was about it. There was like just a couple people that knew me and, and my siblings and my family knew me and I spent a lot of time out in the woods and I was kind of a weird kid. I mean, honestly, growing up, I didn't, like I said, and I had a lot of trauma growing up and honestly, I just didn't really feel like talking. And so that didn't really make me a cool kid at all. So I, I spent a lot of time listening to people rather than talking and that's kind of where I learned, I don't know, just kind of how to, uh, discern kind of bullshit and everything. <laughs> and I don't know if I could say that on here. But, no, you can say whatever you want. But, uh, but yeah, I kind of like, I could just sit there and listen and kind of watch somebody dig a hole just and I could be quiet and watch them do it or be quiet and watch somebody like, like tell the truth. I just was more of like a, this fly on the wall I felt like my whole childhood and, and nobody really knew I was there. You know, it's very interesting what I see here you know, is is this this kid that has been silent for so long that is that is now blossoming at this point. And you said that not a lot of people knew who you were, and it's it's pretty amazing because everyone's gonna know who you are. You know, and that's that's the irony here. I, I really feel that. I feel like I, I have you here at a at a pivotal moment. Uh, for me personally, but for you and your career as well. Um, I'm no Nostradamus, but I'm a pretty smart guy, you know, and I can see what's going on. And I think right now my prediction is, is in less than two years time, I'm going to be like, I can't f***ing believe Stephen Wilson Jr. was playing in my basement. <laughs> I've spent plenty of money 
come with me Half mud, blood, half milk, kick, whiskey Feeling right at home when it all goes south Should be truck running my mouth, got a strong food Girl, I'm a fool, can it all in a giddy pool Kind as a day is long Fighting with a fist full of fire and a hot fence wire lot of favorites on this record but i always tend to play cuckoo again when it comes on it's a fun song it is tell me about cuckoo where did it come from uh, uh well i was um i wrote that song with jeffrey Steele and travis meadows i remember travis had this one line that kind of started it all it was like one more thing in a long line of things i can't control and i was like that was it like that was all right, and we wrote that song, and we laughed like we've never laughed before. We probably, we wrote it in an hour and a half, two hours. It came out real quick, and we just laughed our asses off the whole time, the whole song. We thought we just wrote this like really stupid song that nobody would ever hear. This is back when I was a staff writer. I wasn't an artist, and it was like none of us were going to cut it and release it. We were like, who do we pitch this to? Like this is weird as hell, and we just. Looked, thought it was just a funny, weird song. And it was very much like a working man song. Like I really channeled my dad and channeled Jeffrey's dad, who's a mechanic. And like, and my brother, like my brother runs my dad's body shop. And I really wanted to channel like, like my brother's energy. Like I really could feel like that. I wanted a song that would, he would turn on in the shop and he would just start skipping across it. Cause it would just like, connect to him it would say everything that he wanted to say i worked in a lot of blue collar jobs before i went to college while i was in college and i got a lot of like uh, back problems because of it too because it was a lot of like heavy duty serious work so I, i've spent a lot of time in the blue collar world yeah and same. uh so really it's like it, it became like a bit of an anthem for that for the working person the working man and the working woman that is just like kind of had it like in it, not giving up, but giving up. <laughs> not giving up on life, but giving up on trying to make sense of it all and just grinding. And it was so, it's really for the for the, the person in that grind of their life that it just it has to keep going no matter what. Hopefully that song gives them a little bit of, maybe a little bit of gas. Hopefully they don't speed. <laughs>
dad was cool which was weird i'm a, a junior and my my dad was a fighter and is like kind of a notorious fighter he had this really big personality and he was a notorious boxer and everybody kind of revered him so i was able to kind of live in his shadow very comfortably i didn't feel like i needed a personality i, I could just kind of live in his and then when he died that, that's a whole other story like i had to kind of figure out where I was in that whole spectrum because that shadow went away and the light was on me. One of the points of contention in my life was personally was, was my dad. My parents split up when I was a couple years old and, and uh, I would go visit my dad on the weekends and he was this larger than life character, much like what you describe your dad as. And he was generous, great, all these things and he got lost along the way and became someone completely different. He passed away. He ended up taking his own life, which is very difficult for me. So and we sorry, had this man. dysfunctional relationship, very dysfunctional, and I felt like it was either gonna be me or him. When it ended up being him, um, immediately I told people that I forgave him and I was over, but it wasn't the truth. It was a point of contention every single day of my life. It was, and it was on the top of my mind, always. I told you that I hike in the morning, and this is when I would contemplate life. But at the top of my mind, every day when I would start, he's there. And there were all these negative feelings. One day, 
I listened to a tune called Father's Son. I listened to Father's Son and it literally bypassed my mind and went straight to my heart. And I'd never really had anything like that happen to me. It really, it took me back. And digging in and hearing your articulation and your love for your father helped me forgive and love my father again. And I wanted to just personally thank you for that. It's, it's a big deal. And, and Stephen Wilson Jr., thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome, Adam. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that song is a gift. They all are, really. Uh, but that one especially, because I needed it maybe just as bad as you did. Right when my dad died, I started the record like in, right after he died. I got $3,333.33 from his life insurance check, and I, I recorded the first four songs with it. And um, and that's kind of what started it all. So it's all like, I mean, he even funded it. His, his death like literally funded the whole thing, uh, or at least the beginning of it. And those songs ended up funding the other songs, which is wild. But when I got to Father Son, I was kind of in the middle of the journey of, uh, of trying to reconcile that whole thing because, you know, he died at 59, too young. I, I said goodbye to him on an iPhone eight in the middle of Kentucky and it just that's not how it was supposed to go down and um it, I was really probably like you very angry and it was on the top of my mind for years like you said it just I woke up with it I went to bed with it it was like a wet blanket I wore everywhere I went uh so when I wrote that song it, it really it dried up that blanket in a, in a way it kind of like helped me shed it so it was a big gift for me because it helped me kind of understand so that song was, was really, it was really special for me. I wrote it, you know, obviously from from my dad, and my dad's last words were on on the phone were write a good song for me, and um, I love you. Um, he said it four times, and then he died literally right there. Yeah, that that song was very cathartic because it, like even when I sing it, when I sing it today, it just like it, it gets a little bit easier. It's like a, a bit of a release. And, you know, my brother, too, being his father's son, I, you know, we, we it, you know, I, I kind of have him in it and I have like my grandfather in it. And in like there, it became like just so much bigger. And, and that and then I found I started singing the song and then I found out that the song, even though it was everything I thought it had to do with me, it had not nearly as much to do with me as I thought it, it had so much to do with so many more people like yourself. It's my dad's way of living on. And it's my way to try to keep him alive. And so, yeah, he's still alive in, in the weirdest way possible through that song.
to hate being called junior But I don't mind any longer I've never known better Cause every bone's dead You wanna change my name, gotta drain my Son of Dad is your new record, and you released that the end of 23, is that correct? Next September, yeah. September, September of 23. Yeah, the day and he it, died. It has, the day day your father died was, yes. was that? Yeah, the album came out on, on September 15th. It was the five-year anniversary of his death. That's when your father died, September 15th? Yeah. My dad died on September 15th, 2019. Whoa. Wow, that's a trip. Okay. So it's gotten critical acclaim, this record, you mm -hmm. know? Billboard, Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone named it top one of the top albums of the year. I think Holler Magazine named it Album of the Year. Correct, yeah. Um, Wild. How does that make you feel? Ah, nervous. Really nervous? Yeah. That's an acceptable answer. Yeah, I don't yeah. do well with compliments. And, uh, like, a, yeah, it makes me nervous. Yeah, and it makes, I mean, it makes me very happy, of course. So, yeah, it makes me feel, like, very overwhelmed in a, in a joyous way because I feel like my dad's hearing that because mm -hmm. it's, like, a critical mass thing. I feel like when the consciousness of humanity concentrates on a singular thing, that critical mass kind of, the other world somehow picks up on it. That gives me, if, if anything, it helps maybe corroborate that maybe my dad is, my dad noticed. He loved trophies and uh, he loved to win and stuff like that. If those came in a trophy form, I would just put it on his shelf.
Year to be young, 1994. Some really cool references in there. I mean, 1994, Adam Blank, I'm in college, you mm -hmm. know, and I remember it very well. Yeah. But yeah, you were into the music and yeah. uh, I'm guessing Nirvana. So, oh yeah. yeah, big time, man. That was the year kind of I got introduced to it all and kind of that's the year Kurt Cobain died. And mm -hmm. I, I was country as hell and like grunge music didn't make it to Indiana until it, it had already kind of taken over the world by the time it came to my doorstep. And so I was really late to the game. The way Kurt wrote was just groundbreaking to me. He wrote with all this like allegory and, and, and used so much metaphor and so much poetry, but still had so much potency. He wasn't just being poetic for the sake of being poetic. And uh, I really gravitated towards his writing style. Your influences, uh, I've heard in the past, Mellencamp obviously is from your area. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you a Mellencamp fan? Oh yeah, he's like the soundtrack to my childhood. I, lo I love Mellencamp too. Have you met him? I did, I met him when I was a kid. Um, oddly related to him. Um, my mom was a Mellencamp, it's a big family. And uh, I have a grandma Mellencamp. The family's really kind of big and divided. And my dad actually um, dated his sister for a, a time, my mama's cousin. So I actually went to his wedding when I was at like 12 years old because of my dad dating his sister. And, and the day before the wedding, we were out at this cabin and he was there because they were like getting all the wedding. Because they, they got married in Seymour where I'm from and this like right on the, the White River. And it was this crazy beautiful wedding. And it was like unlike anything my country ass had ever seen. But it was still very country, still very Mellencamp. It wasn't like big city, but it was just, a, you know, they had like horse and buggies take you down to the thing. It was just like, whoa, I mean, it was like a, uh, it was a big, big thing from my childhood. But the day before, like we went and hung out and uh, they were getting ready and, and John was sitting in a cabin smoking cigarettes. That's all I remember. Yeah. And I sat down next to him and he told me a filthy joke that I, I wish I, I'd do anything to be able to remember, but it was it was inappropriate. <laughs> inappropriate? <laughs> and I remember it means it was great. Yeah, but it was still <laughs> like, I remember being like really clever and really witty, and I think his sister Janet yelled at him like, John, don't do that. And what do you say to the kids? Yeah, like, don't tell him that, but he was <laughs> like, he went back to chain smoking and like chuckled. That's my only memory of John Mellencamp. That's a good I'm one. I'm sure he doesn't remember That's better it, than uh, most. Yeah, yeah. He but that, probably doesn't. Yeah, so he's kind of like a, this kind of, I don't know what you call him. He's like a character in a movie yeah. more so than he was a person for me growing up because that's kind of how he sat in the script. Yeah. I've been uh, bitten by the song bug for a long time. I was on a school bus when I was like uh, 13 and uh, I had a traumatic childhood and I was very worried about my mama growing up. She was with some very abusive men and... And, um, you know, I, I was always worried about something very bad happening to her. I spent my whole childhood worrying about it. And then one time I was on a school bus and this song called Don't Take the Girl came on, which had nothing to do with my mom. Oh, it was that's like, a killer. Sing by Tim McGraw. Yeah. And it just destroyed me. Like a preteen kid on a school bus on a farm route. It's not a good look to be crying on a school bus and I, I couldn't stop it like there's nothing I could do to prevent it I was just like you know just kind of throwing my backpack over my head and and I was what in the world just happened to me ever since that day I guess trying to pay it forward in, in whatever way possible because that was that was the day when I knew like songs songs are and music is magic it is it, it isn't just notes and sounds and beats and it's pure energy yeah it is and it's got something so much bigger than anything else it's it's like all of us combined and I, I don't really I don't know how to explain it and as a scientist I used to try to like figure out how to explain everything but I've let go of it and I'm just kind of good with the magic now
turn to flies The whole world's going to hell Mama's back in jail Just can't get enough Think we've had too much Gunfire in the schools Melt down the golden room Where your promise ring Preacher's got a thing for me Keep it to yourself The whole world's gone to hell A snake will crawl the earth To shed its skin To make more room for the poison And the filthy rich Or I'll be clean Until you raise your voices And a louder one above the rest Will call himself the rebel There's a one you know They're still born with the dirt. Work hard for the man. Spare the right, he'll use your hands. Yeah, the hate will break you down. You're the toughest guy in town. I oh, will say, can you see? Here's pharmacy A needle through the vein Might be the thing that'll kill the pain Go trade away your soul You swear the world will never know That you even hear How he whispers in your ear A snake will crawl the earth To shed its skin To make more Steel that came with this, and there's a guy named Bobby Jr. who plays lap steel for my friend Mark Broussard. And so I gave Bobby Jr. the lap I know steel, Bobby. but it was really well, he has the lap steel, and it's Sweet. the same finish as this. And at some time in the 60s, a guy was like, I'm here for the gig, you know what I mean? He had his lap steel yeah. in this, and so I've been waiting for the right person to give this amp to. And it's a pretty special amp, but I'd like Sweet. you to have this. Damn. And again, these are uh, these are instruments that oh come to me for a reason. And I'm doing the right thing with them. You Can I, I mean? ask you, were these meant to be demolished? Demolished. And I found that one literally was in the crane's claw. That's crazy. This one I walked by and happened to find. I don't even know. This is it's cute. Right? Wow. It's insane. They show up in my life. Yeah. Literally, that cost me seven cents per pound. It was bought wow. of steel. So you have to think about it. What does that weigh? 20 pounds, maybe? Yeah. So I paid a buck 40 for it. Dude, that is wicked. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, are you serious? Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Yeah, man. God. What else you got, man? <laughs> Let's talk about the scientist thing for a second. Sure. So interesting. Obviously, you grew up boxing. We discussed that, and that was your family <clears> sport. Your father was a boxer. And then I guess you went to college and became a, a microbiologist. How did you go from scientist to, to musician and songwriter? Growing up in my town, I needed a ticket out. 
and science was my ticket out. I knew it would get me out of town and I knew it would keep me out of town and I loved that town, but it was when I was 18, I, I had, a, you know, I wanted to get out and I wanted to get away as far as possible. I was trying to run away from everything. There was a lot of religious stuff and, and science and religion don't usually, at least at that time in my mind, I didn't, they were like, they're on different sides. They don't, they're on different sides of the field and they, they don't play together. And I was like, I wanna see what that side of the field looks like because I've been over on this side of the field and man, it, it was it was a lot with the my kind of fundamentalist religious upbringing. So science like gave me a lot of clarity and I was good at science. Like I was always really good at it in school. Like it just clicked to me. Like I've, like all those academics were just, and my dad didn't know what to do with that at all. I used to go to the library as a kid and like ride my bike it was a 12 mile ride one way and 12 miles back. And I would like go get like science books like and just pack my backpack full of them. And I would go home and I would take notes. I would like basically rewrite the books and I'd have these piles of notebooks of the books that I read. Cause you know, I didn't want to have to go check them back out at the library. I only had 30 days to kind of, so I was constantly trying to just glean information from them. So I was always like as a kid, like, obsessed with nature and obsessed with science and just trying to figure out that how you know how all these systems were working because in religion there was no nothing was working there were no systems it was just like pure chaos so like the science was like the opposite of that so so getting a degree made a lot of sense because everybody was like hey dude you're good at science you should do that like you can be a scientist you don't have to work on cars you don't have to work in a factory you like you got a brain and I, I went and I used it. I knew I was I was good at music, but I never thought like, it wasn't on career day. It wasn't like, oh, go be a songwriter, go be a musician. It was like, everybody was like, no, go be a scientist. So I did that and I just played music as a hobby and I played in indie rock bands because indie rock became like my my thing. By the time I became a young adult, that's kind of what I, I was really obsessed with. So I played in those bands and kind of cut my teeth in those bands and. Graduated from college and and was in this band called Autovon. We ended up getting signed to Epic Records. I ended up like touring as a lead guitar player in the band and like writing songs. I wasn't a singer or anything. And I started singing background vocals in the band. That's kind of where I started singing. Period. I never in it. I never sang as a kid. Like I was so shy. Like and it would have, if you'd have told me that I'd be doing this like. Nobody, including me, would have believed you. I, I just, I'm telling you. I graduated school, started the band, and it took off, and we were, we were touring a ton, touring with national acts, and that's kind of where I cut my teeth on the road, kind of learned how to perform in, in ways and kind of like work with a crowd. Even though I was the lead guitar player, I was still like a big part of the sonic tapestry of the band, and I was an eager player. I was playing way too many notes back then, but uh, I was really into it. And um, and then I met my wife, and she had a little boy who became my stepson. And I kind of had to put, you know, the, the indie rock band, basically I had to say bye to that. And I, I went and got a job working in R&D for Mars, the food company. They offered me a job, because I was doing like these contract gigs for them. And they offered me a salary and I like being a poor kid from Southern Indiana, it was more money than I'd ever seen. And I was like, well, I, I gotta do that. I was making like $16,000 a year in that indie band living in a van. So I took the job, but I could not stop writing songs. And because of that band, I gotta be say, it was really grateful because I got to be put in some writing rooms in Nashville and I kind of got to see how the machinery of, of Nashville songwriting and how like songs are like, oh, there's like people that actually do this and like they dedicate their whole lives to songwriting. You know, you, you don't have to be an artist. You can just be a songwriter. And I found out like, oh, and then it kind of came back to that Tim McGraw, don't take the girl moment. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I want to do. And I'd already had this degree, but I kept working as a scientist and was writing every day in the lab. And I just got to a point after working for the company, they were an incredible company, take, took great care of me. And I had this boss there that took me aside and he, he saw me writing all the time. He knew what I wanted to do. I was good at science, but he could tell where my passion was. And he's like, you know, I just want to let you know they're, they're about to put the golden handcuffs on you here. And I was like, what, what do you mean golden handcuffs? He's like, yeah, they're about to give you a, a promotion. They're kind of grooming you for 
the next level and it's coming it's and you're kind of at a crossroads because if you if you take it like i took it 30 years ago like your dreams of being a songwriter they're going to be gone because this is going to this is going to consume every bit of you right now you can still write songs and do this job but in six months from now i don't i'm not sure if you're going to be able to and i just want to give you a warning like that's a good problem you're going to be making a lot more money and i was like okay but but that dream's gonna it's gonna be gone i'm telling you and i was like okay and i thought about it for a long time and it, it had been happening for years like i kind of knew i didn't belong there like it and like the voice was getting louder and louder and louder so that kind of corroborated when he he brought he came and told me that like it was it was like i was walking in and it was like something was screaming at me to get the hell out of there it's like and then he came, sat me aside and told me the golden handcuffs thing, and that scared the hell out of me. And it, maybe like six weeks later or something, I can't remember exactly, but I put in my two weeks and I was gone. And everybody was there was like, what? Like, you're like, they're grooming you for management. Like you're like kind of, you're, you're literally stepping up the corporate ladder, like which it was everybody there was trying to do. And it was happening for me and I just left it. And I went and bartended and waited tables and did everything I could to figure out how to get a publishing deal. Cause I knew like, that's how I would really get into the song game. And I took publishing meetings and nobody wanted anything to do with me, to be honest. It was like this bro country era thing was happening real bad. And I, had, I didn't like it. I, knew, I didn't know even how to participate in it but I, I knew what kind of country songs I loved. And most people told me like, hey, you, you don't write enough songs about girls or trucks or beer. And it was always like, man, you like write real songs. That's what yeah. they would say. Like, hey, we can't do nothing with that. And I was like, oh. But a real song is the, was the reason why I got into this game is because of a real song. And that's all I wanted to write were real songs. Like if that was a bad thing, cause he made it sound like it was a bad thing. I got many rejections. <laughs> and this guy named Chris Oglesby from BMG Publishing heard one of my weird songs that most people would have been like, this is a real song, mm -hmm. <laughs> can't do nothing with it. He was like, I love this. And I want to, he signed me on the spot. He brought me in his office and just said, hey, whatever this is you're doing, I love it. He's like, I know this isn't what people are wanting right now, but he's like, I think people need real songs. And I think you're, a, a, for whatever it means, you're a real songwriter. And he began to kind of put me in rooms with other real songwriters, uh, like those Larry Johnsons and stuff that wrote Don't Take the Girl. And those, not Larry Johnson himself, but those types of writers. And that's when I, I kind of, I went to songwriting school. I got to write with Tom Douglas and, you know, Jeffrey Steele and so many songwriting Hall of Famers, Nashville Songwriting Hall of Famers, which is such a, it's one of the most prestigious Hall of Fames you can ever get into. And I got to sit in the rooms with these people and write dozens and um, if not 30, 40 songs with each of them and kind of go to songwriting school. And I really just wanted to be a songwriter. I wanted someone to sing my songs. I, I just never in a million years thought it would be me.
singing your own songs no never right before my dad died i'd play him all my demos 
And uh, and I would sing my demos. He would play them, and he you know he loved a, a lot of my songs. But he's something he would be critical about more so than others. A lot of times he'd be like, "Why don't you just sing these songs?" And I'd be like, "Dad, I don't do that. That's that's not what I do. Someone right. else sings the song. I write the songs." So it was like a paradigm kind of line. Was there a drawn moment or a person that said, "Hey, who's this guy singing the song? What got you over the hump, so to speak?" Well, I mean, there was some, you know, Chris would pitch these songs. Chris Oglesby from BMG mm -hmm. would pitch the songs, and he would come back to me. He's like this cowboy dude. He'd be like, dude, like people are asking <laughs> about these songs. Like, who's singing them? Like, do you want me to tell them? Like, what are, you, what are you like? And I was like, no, I'm just a writer, Chris. I'm a writer. I don't sing the songs. And he was like, okay, dude. We'll just... Anyway, but then uh, my dad died. And really, that's what broke it. I'd been like singing songs out in writer's rounds, and I would kind of sing when I had to. I would sing on the demo. You know, I just had, I had no belief in myself. Like, my dad always believed in me way bigger than I believed in myself, like, and on all facets of life. So he would say that, and then I would argue with him. Like, he would say, like, an obvious thing, and I would tell him he was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, and then when he died, I didn't have no one to argue with anymore. And like that guy that argued with him and told him, no, I don't sing the songs. That guy died with him. When, when he died, like my brain was rewired instantly. It was like a death of myself. The kid living in his shadow, like I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the shadow was gone and it was, the light was on me. The spotlight was all on me now. Like, who are you, dude? Like, I was so attached to him in so many ways and, um, so that guy, like I said, that guy died. He, he didn't matter anymore. That, the guy that said, no, I don't sing the songs. Regretfully, I was like, well, I, you know, I wish my dad could have heard these songs, you know, like I'm, go I'm gonna sing these songs and I'm gonna sing them for him. I'm gonna, re I'm gonna record them so he can hear them. Cause it felt like the only way I could get to him anymore. Like I couldn't like pray to get to him. I couldn't meditate to get to him. I could only like sing to get to him. So selfishly, I, I, I just started singing and it kind of, I guess, connected me with him. I, I went and played this festival like three week, two weeks after he died. I canceled it. I was supposed to do it. It was a songwriters festival in Deadwood, South Dakota. And you know, they had to like everybody do like a cover of a song at the end of the festival. And I do this cover of Stand By Me. It's like, it's something I've always, I've always been haunted by that song. Uh, the Benny King song, and um, I do the kind of a weird version. I'd just been playing it in my living room for years and just singing it for nobody, just myself. And I went and did the festival, and it was actually very healing because a friend of mine kind of really prompted me to go out there and because it's in the Black Hills and it's really spiritually charged land. And he's like, there's there's something, there's a reason you need to be here. And I was like, okay, well, whatever. And I was like, just devastated. I was like, just a... I don't know, a shell of a, man, of a man at that point. Two weeks after he died, I probably hadn't slept in a week. I was in bad shape. And, and there was like 5,000 people at the end of this festival, big crowd. And like I said, I wasn't an artist. I was just a songwriter. And, and I went and sang Stand By Me, and I can't explain it. I mean, there's video footage of it, but it doesn't do it justice. Uh, but it, like, it turned into like a, a revival, like in the, in the middle of that song. It was like if I, you know, doubted that I was an artist in that moment, I would have been the biggest fool in the world. It was like God's way of like making it blatantly obvious, and it kind of it's kind of how it had to go down, and and it felt like I was wearing my dad on my shoulders the whole time. It was like a this weird reversal of roles, and and it was like a. Like, a, I guess like a knighting of sorts, like, you know, like, no, you're no longer a songwriter now. Like in that moment, literally when I sang that song on that stage, it was like, you have now, you're, you're now different. And, and that, that's the moment when I knew like, oh, everything's different. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do at that moment, but I knew it was never going to be the same again. So everything is different. One thing about you, <clears throat> Stephen, that I think's very fitting for where you're what you're talking about is you talked about a spotlight <clears throat> and a lot of people concentrate on on themselves their, their ego what's what's right here 
in, in front. And we live in this kind of spotlight consciousness, it's called. But I, I feel like your songwriting and, and you in general, whether you know it or not, you pay attention to what's in the floodlight. You pay attention to everything around. Without that, that's where all the beauty is. Mm -hmm. Most people were stuck right here. But without a reference of everything around it, what's right in front of you means nothing. Yeah. It's just something floating in space. Everything else is where the beauty is. And I feel like your artistry is, is second to none. You know, it's, it's incredible. Um, I, I, see, I see pain, I see aggression, I see care, I see, I see a big heart. I see a smart man. I see all kinds of stuff. And, and it's easy to identify all those characteristics in which I described when you're telling the truth. And I think at its core, you are telling the truth. And that is so refreshing. And where you came from as a shy kid to, you know, boxer to a scientist to, you know, an introverted songwriter that is now has this voice that is so unique and now it's just coming out. It's uh, the timeline on its own is, is an enigma, you know, it is. And yeah. um, I'm just excited for you, man. I, I'm so glad to, to know you, to have this opportunity and this platform to really sit down with an artist that has been transformative for me personally is great. And, and I can't wait for everyone out there to, to find out about Stephen Wilson Jr. Because if you haven't heard of this guy, do yourself a favor. This will blow your mind. Just, just it'll give you a pay raise. I promise you. You need this man in your life. I, I just can't say enough. And anything I can do to be a positive influence, to push you forward. If you ever need anyone that you can depend on, I know we don't know each other that well. I promise you, you can call me and you can depend on me. Thank you mean you, that Adam. much to me. Well, thank you, sir. You do. It means the world. Yeah, thank man. You. Oh, yeah. Do you, mind, okay. do you mind playing a tune while you're in here? No, not at all. I'd be happy to. I appreciate that. Let's go for it. Let's all right. It. Let me set up here. You got anything new? I have a few, yeah. All right. I do. Um... You have a song that's it's not released, um, but um, yeah, I'll play it. It's a tough one for me to play, um, but I'll do it anyway. This is called I'm a Song, and uh, it was my dad's favorite song of mine. He told me it was his favorite song, ever. This was like one of the last conversations we ever had. And, and this is one of those, why don't, we, why don't you just sing it conversation songs? And this is one of those songs that I told him, no, I don't do that. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm the show in San Antonio, in the middle of a rodeo. The daddy's hand that you used to hold when you walk back to the car. I'm the sound of the county fair, Ferris wheel kisses high up in the air. A sip of brandy when your soul is bare and you need to share your heart. It'll hit you, it'll get you where you're going So you never go there alone I'm the melody glued to the memory That you can't shake when it comes on I'm the part of you that you listen to Riding in the radio all night long I'm a song Oh, oh, I'm a song First time that you got high, I even helped you realize that she wasn't right for you. You fall down, I pick you up again. I helped a boy become a man. 
When your best friend died, I helped you cry And finally turned him loose I'm the words that'll hit you, that'll get you where you're going So you never go there alone I'm the melody glued to the memory that you can't shake When it comes on I'm the part of you that you listen to right now the truth and thank, thank you, you so much for coming to the print shop you and your your lovely bandmates man what a special day man this is uh this is this is it for me thank oh, you so much same here as well been very special to me thank I you i wish you the best of luck and i can't wait to uh to just watch it happen i'm gonna be on the sidelines giving you so much positive energy and i'm gonna tell everyone i know about you yeah well thank you so much it means the world I need that energy. Cool. And uh, it's been a real blessing, for real, to be able to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. <laughs> that was a wrap. <laughs> Mountains 